number one cause of death for people living with diabetes is heart disease. The amount of deaths from autoimmune disease in general is actually higher than heart disease, cancer, diabetes. But stress itself is what we need to learn, to balance, to manage. Otherwise, we will die from the consequences of stress. There are other methods for healing or in healthcare than just what we've been taught or programmed. What if we restored mitochondrial function? They don't care at all what happens to your quality of life. So we're talking about the diet style that's most favorably designed to slow the aging process, prevent disease, prevent cancer and dementia and also reverse disease. How do we create spaciousness for ourselves? Every step you take, you go, you evolve. You go, you evolve, you expand your consciousness. You expand your consciousness, you develop more internal power, you become more available, you become more ready. Life then, God gives you more. If you are seeking greater health, wealth, and happiness, then you're in the right place. Welcome to the number one holistic health podcast in the world. Now, here's your host, best-selling author, inspirational speaker, and award-winning documentary filmmaker and health researcher, Nathan Crane. Welcome to the podcast. I am super excited to have a good friend here with us today, Brian Vaisley. That's Vaisley, rhymes with Paisley. Not Vasily, not Vaisley, not Vasily, it's Vaisley. Uh, uh, it's funny because um, I, I often uh, I remember first time I actually met Brian. Um, Brian, by the way, is an, an anti-aging expert. He's a best-selling author. He's a highly successful entrepreneur, um, deeply big-hearted, caring person. Uh, runs the Art of Anti-Aging. You've probably seen his mega successful summits that reach hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and you know he really he really started all of this in personal development many, many years ago and uh, has been helping hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people today, learn how to take control of their health, to overcome all kinds of chronic health challenges and live with just a better quality of life, um, to live longer and healthier. But the first time I met you, Brian, I still remember it. Yeah, you said you said it's it's Vais. I said, how do I how do I pronounce your last name? You said Vaisley like Paisley. And the thing is, what's funny, dude, is when I was um I used to work for a T Mobile distributor when I was like 18. And yeah. it was the first time I learned how to tie a tie. And I learned my pops actually told me how to do it on the phone. I was looking in the mirror and you know, learn how to tie a tie so I could get to my uh job. Uh, interview and somehow I passed that interview. I got hired, but you had to wear like a suit and tie and dress real nice. We were selling, we were basically selling phones, cell phones in the mall, right? Yeah. So this is like 2005, 2006. <clears throat> Crazy sales job, by the way. But um, after I started making some good money and worked up like three or four promotions in the first year, um, all the ties that I bought were like Paisley ties. I loved that like Paisley look, and people would be like, Oh, that's like an old man tie or whatever. I'm like, dude, I love it. Like, that's my look, man. I, I, uh, I loved it. So when you told me, yeah, it's basically like Paisley. It's like first thing came to mind. I was like, oh man, my my favorite ties. So uh, anyway, Brian, thanks for thanks for jumping on the podcast today, dude. I appreciate hey, it. Hey, man, Nathan, it's good to be here. And I wish you'd wore uh, one of those Paisley ties in the interview. Maybe <laughs> next time we can do that. I myself, you know, even though I say that because, yeah, my last name has been pronounced, uh, the variations you noted in every other under the sun. Uh, so I, it's the only word I know that it rhymes with is Paisley in English, <laughs> at least. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe I should wear Paisley just kind of as a reminder, but I don't. I do have one Paisley shirt. It's pretty loud, pretty loud shirt. I'm not sure how that traction <laughs> in this interview, but uh, I think I do have a couple old man Paisley ties too. Come to think of it, next time we do this, let's both wear Paisley ties. I think I actually <laughs> have. I still have one or two from. I spent all my money on my clothes back then. It was terrible. <laughs> like every time I get a paycheck, I go buy like you know a hundred dollar shirt from Nordstrom's and like an eighty dollar tie, and you know, and all of a sudden my paycheck was gone. Like I had a great closet full of great. <laughs> Great looking clothes, but I had no money left over at the Sounds end of the 18. week. Sounds about right. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, 
it was a crazy time, man. But um, you know what's really interesting? We both really got started um, in personal development, right? Didn't you start, uh, let's say, your your career to up until this point? Like, didn't you really get started in personal development? I know you were doing marketing as well, but wasn't it personal development that like really got you got you going years ago? Well, um, I mean, I really became known for helping build uh, before even all that uh, what you're referring to man back in 2002 and three and four and five um, you know and I don't know if you want me to name names here but helping you know a certain doctor become extremely prominent it was you know he and Mercola I, right Joe yep Joe yeah Mercola. we can say, we can say Mercola I think so, it's yeah, yeah he's, he's a he's a lightning rod character <laughs> And uh, yeah, nobody knew his name back then, of course. I mean, you know, he and I, uh, in that sense, in that business sense, worked really well together and we built that out. And so for, for quite a few years there, um, even after that, I was helping a lot of others become very prominent. I worked with and helped Dr. Mark Hyman and a lot of others out there. Um, and then, uh, you know, I knew how to really uh, put people out there and get their important messages is heard far and wide and that's when i was like yeah the first time that i became a face in front of cameras so to speak and on stage and did a lot of traditional media as well and you know uh, different news channels interviewed me and what forth what have you was as a personal development um brand i guess we'll call it that right so it's intense experience is you know is a brand that i built out um you know, that, that website's still out there to this day. You you can't miss it when you see it because it looks like it's from the 1990s because it really is, you know, yeah. in the early 2000s. And it's just kind of preserved as this monument with what I think a lot of people still appreciate a lot of the writing if you can get past the so-called design <laughs> of intense experiences. But it's still out there. And if you Google your people, name, if you Google your name, that's the first site that still shows up or it's in the top three or whatever. Yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing. And I'm kind of like, oh, we'll leave it, you know, as a, as a monument out there, because, you know, the posts, the articles themselves are still really strong, you know, even though they're couched in this, uh, <laughs> in internet terms, ancient looking, uh, you know, design. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, and out of that, I, you know, I, I wrote uh well, one book uh, through a major publisher, major distribution, it became a bestseller. It was translated into Mandarin Chinese even. And uh, it was even a bigger seller in China, you know, than it was here. I, to this day, I don't know what they translated. So it, it, it could be, <laughs> you can't read be a, a communist manifesto number. Two, but, <laughs> you know, I don't know what they translate, but it did really well there. The nine intense experiences, the nine ways to follow your, the, the nine reasons you must live, listen to your government if you want to <laughs> live long it. and healthy. Yeah. <laughs> I might be a national hero there for all I know. I <laughs> That's funny, dude, because I just got back. So I don't know if you can see it. This book back here, Becoming Cancer Free. That's that's um, my that's an Amazon bestseller that I wrote last year. But I just got it back. These guys reach out to me in from uh, they wanted to translate it into Slovenian. Wow. And, cool. they just, and I said, cool, let's do it. And so they just sent me and here's what it is. And I and it says. And uh, I have no idea what it says, but it's freaking awesome. It's, yeah, it's cool. It's, it's cool to see your book in a different language and knowing that you're helping people in another part of the world, right? It's like I loved it. Yeah. Epic. Yeah. yeah so yeah. we'll see how that sells over over in that part of the world. <laughs> my origin of my last name is Hungarian, which is right next door to Slovakia. So um I could try my, I know a little bit of Hungarian and I, but that's got nothing to do with Slovakian. So never mind. <laughs> I was like, can you try to help? help. <laughs> yeah. You can read Mandarin Chinese. I'll try yours. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you, so you, your book sold more in China then, huh? That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I did well here, but it did really well there, you know, which is. The, the, the nine intense experiences. So what is the, what give us the, like the premise of that book. Sure. So the nine intense experiences. So this was based really on, man, over a decade of, of study um, long before all of the recent research that I'm pleased to see coming out on the importance of awe, A-W-E, and uh, making sure that you engage in awe um, 
experiences that that drive awe it's super healthy for you in a lot of different respects we can touch on but long before all that um you know i myself delved into uh basically that and i started studying different cultures um and uh, different times what are the most life-changing experiences that human beings can engage in mm. that really um, impact your health at a physical level, uh, mental, emotional, and uh, dug deep into that. And I identified, you know, through different cultures across different times, nine key different areas of experience that are core to uh, being human, to engaging in if you want to live life with a capital L, to becoming healthier. Um, you know, we don't have to dive into all of these now, uh, you know, but I can touch on some of them for you. Um, but, you know, the bottom line I found is that many of these experiences, people are not engaging in nearly at the level that they need to be. And it's tied mm -hmm. to things like the loneliness epidemic plaguing, you know, our, our uh, Western world really here today. So many people feeling lonely. So a couple of the experiences that, you know, the first one is um, really got to do with playing and adults tend to frown on playing right now. People may not be frowning, but they do not prioritize playing, getting more joy in life and going out and having fun, um, you know, uh, like it in different times that they used to. It's yeah. kind of frowned down upon, you know, because I got important things to do. It's pushed off in the corner of when I can get to it. Or as for kids, you know, that's for the kids. Yeah. I'm an adult. I don't play anymore, which which is total bullshit. Like it's it's a conditioning that limits us from, you know, experiencing the highest level of life at any age, like the happiest people I've ever met in my life, and I'm sure you have too, that are, you know, 60, 70, 80, you know, Bernie Siegel. I don't know if yeah. you've ever talked to yeah. Bernie Siegel. Yeah. He's, he's 90. He's turning 91 this year uh, in October. And he, I just talked to him the other day. He left me a voicemail and he's like, because we're talking to him about coming out to our conference in October. And he called me back and left me a voicemail. He's like, well, if it doesn't work out, I'll send my, I can send my twin brother in my place. <laughs> he, can, he can speak for me. Nobody knows I have a twin, but but he knows all my talks. He can speak for me, but but nobody really knows about him because he's been in prison for the last ten years. Right? He goes on this elaborate story, and uh, and and you know, and at the end, it's like he's just joking and he's playing. He's having a good time. Like this is somebody who has lived life to the fullest. You know, you know, about to be ninety one, and that's you know, the no plays and jokes every day, and it's so. <laughs> awesome to to be around that you know it really is and you know it's again you mentioned appreciate it you know that uh, i have the art of anti-aging and uh, you know we could dive more into this too if you want anti-aging doesn't mean you're against getting older it means anti this message of aging that equates it with being over the hill and doomed to suffering and you know things are all downhill from here in terms of the way you look and you feel and this is an extremely prevalent mindset out there. It's probably the most dangerous toxin of all, because a lot of people, you know, even when they hit 40 and certainly beyond, adopt that mindset. They, they, they can't shake it. You know, right. again, they might not publicly state that, but they believe I'm going downhill. And if you believe that down, you go. And, you know, I've put so much uh, hopefully helpful material out there um, in, in very physical sense of health on, on how to live long, but it doesn't mean anything. What you really want to do is live well while living long, you know? And so the material, when I was more of this personal development uh, expert, I guess, or brand with the nine intense experiences, it applies a hundred percent. You know, that's just the first experience. I mean, I got the, yeah, I happened to grab the book, you know, right here, the nine nice. sense experiences. And I call that that first one journey back to Neverland. And mm. in the book, it did really well because I give people very specific, enjoyable, you know, no matter which the experience or in some cases, um, awe inspiring exercises to do. And what I highly recommend to people, Nathan, if, if especially if you're feeling resistance to this right now or you're downplaying the importance of play, one thing is go back. Write down the 10 favorite books you had, let's just say as a preteen or a teen, and go back and read those books. 
go back and read those books. It's like a spark happens inside of you. You know, I put Neverland. There's many plays on the word Neverland, but because Peter Pan was one of my own, you know, favorite books. And and when you go back and you and you reread those that gave you such awe and and pleasure and wonder when you were young, it char it recharges this wonder inside of you. It's just one way in. You know, each chapter has I don't know six seven different exercises to do of different sorts. You know, but yeah, that's just the first experience uh, in the book. But it's important. That's a cool idea, and I think it's you know at at any age, right? Like I have kids, young kids, eleven and seven, so. Um, like, you know, we watch Disney shows and different, um, uh, you know, cartoons, animated shows, things like that. And I really like them. I still enjoy them. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's easy for me to like get into that because I have kids and it's also easy for me because I've had great mentors since I was 20 years old up until now who were forties, fifties, but they were profound spiritual teachers who lived by yep. who lived uh by the teaching be childlike N don't be like a child right don't be naive right. and inconsistent and without discipline and and all that but be childlike that open-hearted that fun playing that curious always be like that and so <laughs> i've had those teachers in my life continuously reminding me to be that way. And so I choose to be that way. Right. And I'm, my kids really help me because I can play with them. Um, and, but even, even at my age, you know, I'm, we can talk about, you know, we can be experts on anti-aging because I, I just turned 67 and people say I look 35. So, <laughs> so something must be working, but, but even at my young age, um, you know, I, I still have to choose to play, right. I could easily be like, no, 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 I don't want to, which many times I don't want to. But I choose, I put myself into it and then I enjoy, you know, I'll chase the kids around the house or I'll pretend to be a monster or whatever. Dude, I've got people like at my gym, 35 years old, right? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting too old for this or I'm too old. I, it's just that, that subconscious belief and that they say it again and again and again. Oh, I'm getting too old. I'm like, how old are you? 35? Are you kidding me? Like there's 62 year olds that are doing more than you're doing right now. And they're not complaining about being too old. Like, like shut it, you know, <laughs> now, but that carries on into, if you started it in your thirties, guess what? It's going to carry on into your forties and your fifties and your sixties and your seventies. And you're always going to feel too old to do something fun, enjoyable, meaningful, and, and good and healthy for your body as well. Because you know, as you believe it, it literally manifests into your physiology, as as you know, um, as I'm sure you probably write about in the book. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're 67, Nathan. And I'm telling you what, I'm <laughs> I'm in my 80s, and I'm gonna tell you, it gets better, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say you're like but 87. True. You're like 87, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I am. Uh, no, I'm not. But I, I am in my 50s. And, uh, you know, honestly, it'd be kind of hypocritical if I didn't work hard at trying to adapt everything that I know and try to offer other people. And, uh, you know, life is even better now. It comes equipped with many challenges, as it always has, right? Um, and I've had, certainly had my fair challenges early in life. now. But life is better now than it was yesterday, last year, uh, the last decade and so on and so forth. And that's just, that's not just, you know, like puffery. Um, that is truly what I feel, uh, you know, in my bones and my brain and stuff like that, because you make an effort, like you said, I mean, you do have to make the effort. You have to get past the voices telling you, I've got more important things to do than, than enjoy life. No, you don't. What's the point of life? I mean, you know, try things, try new things, make a list of, you know, they could be small, medium, large, go out and try new things. If you're fortunate as you and I both are to have kiddos at home, you know, young ones, well, it does make it a little bit easier. You know, in one sense, uh, you know, they say that they, they make you older and in another sense, they make you younger. I mean, you know, you, you, the stress factor, you know, I got a little gray going on in the beard and that's part and partial to it. But the other side of it is they keep me young, you know? And if you don't have, if you're not fortunate to have kids at home, uh, you know, maybe grandkids or nieces, nephews, whatever it may be, just get down 
on the ground, if possible, with them and play and look at their world. You know, there's there's different types of genius and there certainly is um, genius that comes with experience and older age. But there's this not, youthful genius and yeah. to try to retain that. And there are ways to get back into that. Like I said, read those magical books when you're young. Watch those favorite films. Uh, play the stuff that you played one time. Go to the friggin' arcade. They still exist. They're out there, arcades, yep. right? Go to the arcade and just, if, if pinball was your thing because you're of that age, go do it again. Sounds silly. It's going to open you up, you know, in, in some major ways. So, you know, just one of the nine experiences I, I really highly recommend to people. Well, the the... So talking about anti-aging, talking about longevity, which is your specialty, um, and cancer, which has been my specialty for over a decade now, we know and the science has shown that the more you play, the more you have fun, the more you find things in life that you enjoy to do that bring you some laughter, bring you some joy, and that could be anything. I mean, it could be just playing tennis where you're you just enjoy it. It brings you, you know, playing a game. It could be a, a sports game. It could be, you know, chess. It could be, you know, chess can get a little intense, but uh, <laughs> it still can be, if you play a little more lighthearted, it could still be very fun, right? Like things that bring out that joy in you uh, that are done, let's say, in a healthy way. You're not like hurting yourself or hurting other people in a bad way, <laughs> right? That, <laughs> like some people get some pleasure out of that. It's not the kind of pleasure I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, we know that it uh, increases lifespan, decreases all-cause mortality, decreases cancer risk, decreases diabetes, heart disease risk, decreases Alzheimer's risk, you know, improves not only longevity of life, but it, as you said, quality of life. So, you know, that's just one of the one of the things that we can be doing and really should be doing pretty often, um, which, you know, life is that much more. I love that you said, like, if you're not enjoying life, then what's the point? Right. Like and we all can enjoy life. We, we all can do it if we choose to and we strive to and we heal the stuff that's inside of us that's preventing us from enjoying life because a lot of those subconscious beliefs that are buried deep that you know were handed down to us when we were children or we went through some kind of trauma that you know that uh, buried deep within us this this deep-rooted belief that life is meant to be hard and challenging and you know i have to be i have to survive life you know it's always against me you know, all of these beliefs that so many people, unfortunately, are given as children, many of that I experienced as a child, you know, I had to overcome and heal a lot of these deep rooted beliefs to get to the point where I see, oh, life, actually life, God, the universe, whatever you want to call it, is actually here to support us in evolving in growing in learning and, and enjoying all that this life has to give us. And that's a that's a shift in our mentality and in our perception. And I can tell you going from the one extreme of drug addiction and homelessness and in and out of jail and really feeling like I was living in hell on this earth to the opposite, which is like, I really feel like I'm living in heaven on this earth, right? That is a, it's a monumental shift in our perception in the way that we see the world. Hey, I just want to take a quick second and thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you're enjoying it so far. As a special thank you for tuning into this episode, I want to give you my number one Amazon best-selling book absolutely free. You can go download it right now at becomingcancerfree.com. If you want to learn evidence-based strategies for helping your body become a cancer-fighting machine for not only cancer reversal but cancer prevention, go grab a copy of the book. Again, I'm just giving it to you for free. You can go download it at becomingcancerfree.com. All right, let's get back to the show. 100% well said. You know, one of my favorite quotes, let's see if I get this right. George Bernard Shaw, so playwright uh, from long ago. We don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. I love you know, it. So I'll bottom line with that. It, it, you know, just like all things, it really is about mindset. And if you see the world as a, as, like you said, a rough place, a hard place, you know, a battle, it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a battle. And I understand because you and I both come from 
rather challenging earlier backgrounds, you know, I mean, I faced abuse uh, for years as, as a child, and it, uh, it's, it's not easy if you are coming from that, you have to deal with the trauma, you have to, you have to confront it, and that takes time, um, and that surely and understandably can impact the mindset, but don't forget that's that's the goal to reach for is is the way you view the world is what your world will be and uh you know there's a lot of things you can do that's what this whole book is about that we're talking about you know from 10 plus years ago now the nine intense experiences it it opens these exercises these things you can do you don't have to focus on it really work hard at it you can play your way to it you can activity your way to these these breakthroughs that melt away, by the way, some impacts of trauma and a whole lot of other things. It's funny, you brought up, um, you know, the second experience is called dive deeper into your blood. And, uh, you know, I have these fun, interesting names for each of these experiences. But, you know, what that's basically about is the fact that um, we have, we, we don't know the people we know, by and large today, not like we once used to. What I mean is, we can be living with a spouse and children and be close, at least in terms of, you know, seeing them routinely, other family members, even friends. But how much do you really know, you know, about these people in, in your life? When was the last time, you know, that you had a series of deep conversations with those that you love and care about? Asking them, well, you know, what are your goals? You know, are you on a path? Do you like where you're at today? You know, wife? Um, I mean, there's so many questions that we almost take for granted. We think we, we, we are connecting, but we get caught in the rut of life is what I call it. Yeah. And we're going through the motions together and we, we know we're there to support one another, but are we really going deep with one another? So that's the thrust of that experience is the importance of maintaining not surfacey bonds, but deep bonds, dive deeper into your blood, your blood, your relations, but it doesn't just have to be consider you blood, I, you know, Nathan, I consider you a brother, right? And, and it's the depth of conversations that that you have with people, even if you can't, even if you don't see them more than once a year or something in person, you could still have them in conversations like this. Uh, but it also in this chapter delves into uh, your, your history in terms of family. And what interesting happens in a, in a lot of, uh, in pretty much all family dynamics um, or school dynamics when you're younger is we're given a certain script. We become a certain character, sort of speaking of George Bernard Shaw, like in a play. Yeah. And you may be the smart one. You were granted that title in school and or from your parents, for example. Troublemaker, the, troublemaker. <laughs> yeah, you're the troublemaker. Right? Right. I was that myself to some extent. <laughs> the black sheep the comedian, even some of these mean monikers, the fat girl, you mm. know, all of these labels carry weight. Some we think we like, some we want to escape from. But the point is that we're not even you know, so aware of some of these scripts we're living. No. Are you really just a comedian expected to be funny all the time? And are you living that script? Are you really, you know, the, the strong one? I've seen more people who are labeled strong really collapse not too many years deeper into life because they were perceived by family and friends as the strong one. So they were trying to live up to that. You know, so this chapter dive, you know, dives into this experience is about diving into the truth, not just going deeper in conversation with others, but with yourself and asking yourself, am I living a script here. Is that really me? Or is that just one piece of me? And I've been trying to accommodate that script all these years or yeah. trapped in it almost. I think all of us have been living scripts at some point and, and maybe still are right. Like I, that's such a great question that you prompted there and a, and a deep conversation worth having because by 18, I was the, you know, the, the drug dealer, the addict, the you know kid who was going to die, you know, actually at 17. So before I reach 18, you know, in and out of jail, the police and feds were after me. Like I had, I, I, you know, the gangster, like I had envisioned this life. I thought this was the life that was meant for me. It was labels. It was put on me. It was a life that I had fully embodied. And, and I thought that's all 
life was. I had no idea at that point, you know, at 17 years old, uh, turning 18, that there was another kind of life I could have, you know? And, and I yeah. think it's true for teenagers. I think it's true for people in their thirties and forties. And I think it's equally true for people in their fifties, sixties, and seventies that it could, because I talk to people all the time in their sixties and seventies who go, well, this is all I know. This is all I've done. So this is all I can do, which you know, some of the greatest artists, some of the greatest leaders, Nelson Mandela, right? Some of the greatest people in, in our recent history didn't even find that next level of their life until they were 60 or 70 or 80. But I don't think they got there by holding on to the mindset that, you know, this is who I am. This is all I know. I'll never change right? This is all I can do. I think they got there by being open to, you know, what is next for me in life. And that's what happened to me at 18. I had this kind of vision. And then I, I had this realization that like, oh, I could actually change my life. Oh, I don't have to live in this hell. Oh, maybe I could do something good in the world. Oh, maybe I should get healthy. Maybe I should start meditating, yeah. right? So at 18, I started meditating and I, you know, stopped drinking and drugs and I started going to the gym and I started diving deep into personal development and, you know, Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra and, you know, a lot of, you know, these amazing uh, pioneers in, in personal development, listening to everything I could, you know, listen to and then meditating on it. And so at 18 in 2005, like I did a complete 180 switch and dove into this new and started to create this whole new set of beliefs and discover myself. But a lot of it was stripping away stripping away those old belief systems, right? Those old self uh, mutilating thoughts about myself. You know, I was actually very, even though I was very strong on the outside, I was very insecure. You know, I had this huge ego and I want to fight all the time, but I was super, super insecure and weak and afraid on the inside. So I had to heal that. And then I've gone through multiple, so it wasn't like, oh, I healed all that. And then it was, you know, I was good for the you know, rest of my life. It's like, <clears throat> I've gone through multiple iterations of that. And I'm sure I probably still will, right? And that's part of it. It's like this ever evolving and self discovery process. If we're open to it, if we're seeking it, you know, if we're actively choosing different methods, like you're like you're talking about in your book, and different types of therapies and meditations and experiences that can you know, deepen us to really understand who we are, why we're here, you know, what brings us joy and happiness, how can we contribute to, to people and the world in a better and bigger way. And I think if we start asking those questions, you know, amazing things start to open up, right? Um, but a lot of it is like stripping away, peeling away that onion, peeling away the layers, discovering who we really are on the inside beyond all of this you know, these negative scripts or just scripts that we've, we've taken on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You've had, thanks for sharing uh, you know, piece of your journey there. And yeah, I know you've, you've had a strong uh, in the deepest sense uh, journey in terms of uh, acknowledging, you know, a lot of what is perceived as strength is not so strong for you in, in a true sense of living life with that capital L and living long, living well. And, uh, you know, I'm sure it'll resonate with you that, you know, the most discomfort that I see in people is caused by staying in their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's people are listening to this. They're watching this. They're, you know, there's they're, they're reaching out. They want to improve something. Something's not right. Something's not working for them, whether it's a deep disease you know, that's made a physical manifestation in the body or something more, um, not, not so physical, but a dis-ease inside of their brain, inside of their heart, whatever it may be, they want change. They want change. Um, but it's, it's the hardest part is busting through that barrier of comfort. Uh, because if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you've got. It's really boils down to that. So there is this moment where it doesn't have to be, a, you know, a superhero-ish type of breakout of the comfort zone, but you do have to start poking 
out of that egg, you know, poking your way out of that egg and taking the steps, whether it's, whether it is changing your diet in, in small pieces toward better and better or eliminating, you know, toxic products from your life step by step. And in the sense we're talking about here in stepping outside of your routines, your ruts, the comfort zone, and, and, and make, make those moves to have for example, these deeper conversations with those you love, to go play, like we said, in a way that you have not done in years or decades, maybe, and so many other facets. But it's really busting out of, of that comfort zone because nothing causes more discomfort and dis-ease than that comfort zone. Mm, yeah, that's such a powerful point. I just started ice baths again, but now I'm doing um first thing in the morning before I work out. And like, that's very <laughs> challenging for me, very uncomfortable, but I know yeah. through the research and through my personal experience, I've been doing uh, like cold hydrotherapy, cold showers, ice baths, things like that since probably 2008, 2009, off and on over the years. And, but I know that uh, according to some really interesting science, um, I believe out of Japan, that if you do a cold like an ice bath or cold shower for a few minutes in the morning and then work out after you, you not only get that, you know, amazing dopamine boost throughout the rest of the day where you feel really good mental clarity, you know, the immune system enhancement, the uh, burning of the excess brown fat in the body, but specifically, uh, and then it's like 10 shots of cappuccino first thing in the morning too, without the, <laughs> without the come down from the caffeine, but yep. That exercise, that cold uh, ice plunge into a workout um, was shown to boost testosterone significantly, hey. which yeah. is, if you look at, you know, men today, like the, the levels of testosterone in men today have gone down exponentially over the last 30 to 50 years, right? For a lot of reasons, and we could talk about some of that, but even testosterone in women has been going down and, and which is unhealthy. So, but back to your point of like, I don't want to do that, but I've been, and, and I've been thinking about it for like a month, you know, five or six weeks. And then I finally pulled the trigger. It was like, all right, now's the time. And I'm going to just commit to it. So this is, you know, day three in a row. And it's, it's those, but I feel amazing after and, and the discipline to committing to something and getting out of your comfort zone, then it opens up new possibilities for you. To your point, you learn about something that could help you. And then instead of just thinking about it and, and like, oh, yeah, it sounds good and never doing anything, making a plan. Like I was running it through my mind the last five or six weeks. Like, I'm going to do this. Like, I need to do this. I want to do this. This is going to be good for me. You know, like I, talking myself up to it until the point where yeah. it's like, boom, now, now I'm doing it. Um, it's, it's essential, right? It's essential if you want to grow and become a better version of yourself. I'm not saying ice baths are essential. I'm saying to your point, you know, breaking, I like your, like poking holes in the egg, like getting uncomfortable out of your comfort zone. I love that. I wanted to ask you, have you done, I mean, if you're open to sharing, like different forms of therapy over the years, different kinds of therapies, different uh, yeah. i know you've done all yeah. kinds of different like healing modalities mental emotional modalities things like that but different kinds of of therapies that you've found helpful in your life hey i just want to pause a second and ask you are you enjoying this episode so far are you getting good value from this content if so then i know you're going to absolutely love healing life at healinglife.net you get exclusive and premier access to hundreds of the top world's doctors, experts, cancer conquerors and survivors, exclusive interviews that I have done with all these experts and doctors uh, that are not available for free online. They're only available at healinglife.net. So not only do you get access to all of those, but you actually get to speak with these doctors and experts and ask them any question you want about health and healing. And this is available exclusively to Healing Life members. You can try it out for free. Go to healinglife.net and you can start your free trial there. And uh, whether you're interested in learning more about detox or cancer, diet and nutrition and nutritional science, about diabetes, about heart disease, autoimmune disease, anti-aging, longevity, 
All of these topics are covered in depth and more are continuing to be added at Healing Life. And again, you get to talk to these doctors yourself. So I invite you to set up a free trial at healinglife.net. And I hope to see you over there. Now, let's get back to the show. Oh, yeah. I mean, and you're going to, there's so many therapies out there. There's DBT that comes to mind. There's, um, what's DBT? Uh, man, I forgot the, uh, what the acronym stands for on that one, but it's a, der it's, it's derivative of, uh, what is it? C B. Oh, dialectical, it, dialectical behavioral therapy, type of cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. So, right. it's, it's, so it's a, it's a type of cognitive behavioral. So let's talk about cognitive for me personally, <clears throat> cognitive is not exactly something that we could call alternative. Uh, you know, uh, it was once and it's become mainstream because it works. Uh, not for everybody. I'll say this about therapies, by the way. Not only, not only is there no one therapy, obviously, that's going to work for everybody, but there's no one therapy that's going to do, you know, the job for you. And we have to change the mindset almost about therapy. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're broken. Um, I mean, we all are in some ways broken. We're always will be, you know, um, it's about the journey. Right. And what I've seen is, you know, that whether it's CBT, DBT, I mean, whatever, whatever it may be, they, some won't resonate at all with you, but many have their worth, um, to some extent. And then, and then, you know, you may want to move on and try others. Uh, I've done hypnotherapy and that's had certain benefits. Um, but then it also had its limits for me. Um, what I've seen more people try say, okay, finally, you know, talk about cracking open the egg and moving beyond, you know, the zone of so-called comfort, which is really discomfort. It's a big deal, Nathan, for many, many, many people, perhaps many men, maybe I'm stereotyping a bit, but I've seen it's true. Many women too, but many men, especially no, you know, there's still this resonant you know, idea that that's for people who have real bad problems or crazy people or something like that, or no. Um, you know, so kudos to anybody who makes a step toward doing that with any type of other professional involved guide, whether it's very alternative, very mainstream, just kudos to do it. It's not an easy step to take, but I want to say this here because it's so important. Don't expect it to work the first time necessarily. It may, you may get lucky. Don't expect it to work the second time, but please keep at it. Try different individuals, try different modalities. Um, you know, because there is not a single modality that's going to work for everybody. I have seen and it takes time success for, right, for quite a number of people with CBT. Um, you know, if you're looking at that right now, um, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody. It, it, uh, it kind of sweeps aside all of the deep talk therapy in a way many, but again, this is different therapists. They most don't just use a single modality. Anyway, hypnotherapists may, often maybe perhaps, but most don't use a single therapy anyway. What they do is they employ various pieces of different therapies as they believe it befits your situation. And many today do use CBT. It's worth looking up, folks, um, because it has proved quite effective at really, I guess we could say, fixing a lot of... Uh, bad habits that we have as an outcome of some deep-seated issues. Um, you know, there's therapies that do exactly what we talk about, which is break the scripts that you might be living by, right. uh, you know, that either, you know, others imposed on you or you might have imposed on yourself long ago, um, you know, but there's so many, uh, you know, different approaches. But for me, it's most important to stress to people, it works. It's just, what is it? You'll find your own it if, you, if you're brave enough and you have that courage to take that first step into it, if you're new to it and it has some effect, stick with it a while until it starts to wither away and then try a different one. If it doesn't work at first, it's common, folks. It, I really have to stress this. Don't worry about it. Try someone else or some other modality. You will find, you know, a way or multiple ways to get you to wherever that where is that you want to be with this? Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you brought this topic up because that's kind of been contained in me for a while <laughs> to be able to speak about that with people. Seriously. I see so many people get the courage. They try once it doesn't work for me and they're done. I'm like, Oh man, right. no. You, right. You, it's, it's like you finally taught a, a you know, a, a child finally had the courage to try to walk and then he stumbled and like, Nope, this walking thing's not for me. 
you know, <laughs> they'd never learn to walk. Right. If you didn't get back yeah. up and it's no, right. I, I, I love that you're passionate about it. Cause I'm super passionate about it. Cause I, once I realized that it's like, it is a big stigma for a lot of people and I'm like, you know, working with cancer patients all the time, like the number one thing that we coach people through is you need some form of therapy. We have to get to that mental, emotional healing. Like if you don't heal the mind and the emotions and the trauma, your body may never heal. And that's, you know, true for so many diseases, you know, and so it's, we all have every one of us. I never met anybody that didn't have one or more childhood adverse events. Right. Right. At least one or more. I mean, I had probably over a dozen and we know if you have three or more, your, uh, you know, for the biggest study that was done from in the 1990s, three or more childhood adverse events. So these are things like, you know, the loss of a parent, uh, addiction in the family, alcoholism, drug addiction, um, you know, any kind of abuse, mental, emotional, physical abuse, even seeing somebody in the family, like getting arrested, for example, you know, maybe you lost your home, maybe you ended up homeless, maybe you were in a group home, all these kinds of things are childhood adverse events. That study showed that it took 20 years off of your life. If you don't heal mm -hmm. those, if you'd never address yep. those and heal them through therapy, some form or multiple forms of therapy, it takes 20 years off your life, your chances of cancer go up exponentially, your chance of heart disease and all kinds of uh, chronic diseases and chronic addictions go up exponentially versus if you heal them, then you can reduce that and extend your lifespan and reduce the, the um, you know, because you got these chronic, you got neuropeptides that get stored in the body from these traumatic experiences. They can be physical traumas. They can be, you know, uh, even like even surgery is actually a trauma, a divorce is a trauma if you never heal through these things they literally get stored in our physiology and create chronic inflammation and that chronic inflammatory process leads to cancer and other chronic diseases so we have to heal them and really the only way the only ways i found is meditation and therapy and i love therapy i've tried so many different kinds of therapies and they've all helped me in some way or another um, right. You know, I, I, I really like the idea of um, psychedelic therapies now. I have a family member who's going to be trying out a company that uh, is using ketamine therapy. So it's low dose ketamine therapy. And it I've, I've researched it heavily and it looks really amazing. You know, they were uh, studying Navy, the Navy the when I lived in San Diego uh, for PTSD, the military come back with PTSD and studying psilocybin therapy sessions and seeing unbelievable results i believe even better results than they were seeing with any kind of um pharmaceuticals which to me is like mm -hmm. well, of course but to a lot of people that's pretty mind-blowing and there's like little to no side effects and there's no addictive qualities of something like psilocybin which comes from mushrooms magic mushrooms you know mushrooms saved my life when i was 17 18. um i didn't i didn't go into it thinking it was therapy, but it was profound therapy for me. And then, you know, I've tried a lot of different therapies, you know, somatic therapy is a wonderful one. Um, hypnotherapy is wonderful. I've done some hypnotherapy. I've gotten some great results from that. Um, just talk therapy, talking with people, you know, experts on certain things, being able to learn how to process the emotions. Um, there's, there's uh, rapid, the rapid eye movement therapy, which is amazing. Like there's so many kinds. Yeah. There and are so many kinds. Right. Yeah, I totally. I mean, I recommend people just go and search, uh, you know, the different types of, I don't know, mainstream therapy, the main, different types of alternative therapy. Some of my favorites um, involve, you know, because a lot of a lot of these are very uh, engaging the mind directly, but not everyone works on that on that level. Many people are more visual or they're more um sensory and there are some great therapies that are gaining ground that are enjoyable art therapy mm. uh which has different subsets painting um you know music therapy singing therapy equine therapy is tremendous with horses and you are involving your physical being so if you're a person who's more about sensory or certainly if you like you know if you, if you really have a strong feeling and bond with animals consider equine therapy if you have uh, an artistic flair or even if you don't but you know you want to try your hand you you can meld uh, your 
creative release along with a trained therapist who's guiding you during art therapy. It's, you know, the, these are, there's dance therapy, um, you know, so because a lot of people feel put upon if they're sitting there like we are right now in a room, you know, face to face, you know, they have the old Freud thing in mind, you know, where you're sitting on a couch being, you know, tell me your deepest, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be like that. And if you're uncomfortable with that, there's so many ways today in, um, but it's incredibly, Dude, incredibly dream, beneficial. Dream work, dream work oh, therapy. Yeah. Have you yeah. ever done dream work? Yes. You, you can yeah. get so much wisdom from your own dreams. Like I've had, I, I could tell you story after story after story, you know, of like, uh, so learning dream work, learning how to interpret my dreams, and then focusing on something, asking my dreams, asking my soul to show me, you know, the answer to something in my dreams. So talking about therapy and Freud and all that, I'll, I'll share this really short story because it illustrates this incredibly well. So I was learning about dream work and learning about interpreting dreams and thinking about, you know, healing, emotional healing, mental healing, all this stuff is in San Diego is probably like 2007, 2008. And I had this dream uh, and I met this woman who I'd never seen before. And she was crystal clear. I could see her face, her body, everything. And I, I remember opening the car door and she like gave me something and then closed the car door and like we were on the street and it was just this, this woman. I was like, she gave me this thing in it. And then I woke up and it was like, I knew I needed that thing, whatever it was. And, um, and I just had this feeling. And so part of dream work, so part of dream interpretation is, okay, tell me the, you know, show me in my dreams, the answer to X, Y, Z, and then you go to sleep mm -hmm. and then you wake up. And if you remember your dream, write it down. And then you go through an interpretation process and throughout your day, you can say, show me throughout my day more what I need to know about this dream and about you know, the answer to this thing in my life that I'm trying to solve could be a problem, a challenge, relationship, business, health, whatever. And, and at that time, I was just really deep into personal development, self exploration and, and dream interpretation at that time. And, and I just got this feeling. So you got to follow your feelings. That's another big part of it. I got this feeling to just go walk down the street randomly. I was like, I'm going to walk down the street. I was in orange. I was in, uh, what's it called? In San Diego. Uh, down, what the heck is that place called? A bunch of hippies live there. Um, down in, uh, Venice. Yeah, Venice I can't remember. It was, um, I'll, I'll think of it, but not, not Venice. It was San Diego, but um, Diego. yeah. So anyway, so I just was like, all right, just walk down the street and go to the beach and just sit and, and reflect for a bit. Right. And so I'm walking down the street and all of a sudden someone walks out of like a restaurant or something right next to me. And I see them at the corner of my eye and they start walking next to me. And so I'm walking and like, I didn't look over at them. I was just, you know, but I noticed after a couple blocks, they're still right next to me. And, and I was like, what is going on? You know, this person's like right next to me the whole time. We're getting all the way to the beach. And then I go and sit down and they sit down right next to me. And I'm like, I finally look over and it's the, and it's the lady who was in my dream that night. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. This person I've never met before. Right. Super crystal clear. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, do I tell her? Like, she's going to think I'm just like hitting on her, right? Like, I'm just trying to pick what a corny pickup line. <laughs> yeah, you were in my dreams last night, baby. <laughs> right? And so, yeah, yeah. And then I just, you know, and I'm like, I'll just say it sincerely and we'll see what happens. I'm like, I got to tell you something crazy. I'm like, I'm not kidding. You were in my dream last night and, and you gave me something that I needed. And this is what happened. I'm not kidding. Exactly like this. She goes, she opens her bag. She pulls out a book. I'm getting chills remembering this. Hands me the book and she walks away. And I was wow. like, what? I was like, what the fuck just happened? Like, what? I'm like, okay, thank you. And she like walks away. And I look at the book and it's a book about dreams by Freud. Wow. Right. Wow. So I take, so I sit there wow. and I'm just in total awe talking about awe experiences, total awe. I'm like this dream, maybe there's something. Cause I also was doubting the dream stuff, but I was diving into it with like, if it's real, I want to know it, but I had a lot of doubts about it. Right. And so that experience cemented it for me. Oh, this dream stuff is 100% real. Like how could it not be? 
So I take that dream book back to the house that night and I start reading through it. And I remember flipping to a page in the middle, reading a couple pages, closing the book and going, that's exactly what I needed to know. I put the book away, never open it again. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah, And it was just so profound. It was so profound. Um, I don't remember even why, what we're talking about that led me to, to sharing that story, but, um, dream therapy, you know, Oh, (laughs) therapy, going back to therapy, right? Like dream interpretation. So that kind of therapy is amazing, but, um, yeah, it was incredible, man. It was incredible. That is incredible. Yeah. I mean, you know, our dreams predictive, our dreams more than, uh, you know, I can tell you this, at the very least, dreams can reveal so much about, you know, the inner workings of what's happening inside of, of you and stress and anxiety and, you know, um, where you may want to go and the unraveling of it's beautiful. I mean, because you're dealing with these little snippets of stories, yours, uh, you know, that sent chills down me because that, that suggests even something, you know, more to dreams. Um, I recall I was in my uh, man thirties already. And, uh, you know, this is more of a, well, it's close to a nightmare, (laughs) but it was a recurring dream where long story short, I'll save, I'll save all the visuals, very dark and I'm riding on a horse and it's clearly medieval times. And I myself is am in medieval garb and I'm walking, you know, someone, uh, two what appears to be soldiers in front of me on their horses and then i think it was you know family wife maybe behind me and um each night it was just literally felt like 20 seconds of this as we get closer to this uh, to round this wall then one night my horse did turn the corner and a man in in medieval garb including the helmet jumps out and he has an axe in his hand and then i wake up The next night, same thing, but the ax gets closer to my neck. And and then the third night, closer to my neck. And I couldn't, you know, I'm like, what's going on here? What's going on here? And then I recalled that in, you know, so we talked about my last name. Well, I had heard this before many times that, uh, you know, from Hungarians who live in Hungary, oh, your last name's a royal name. I'm like, well, what does that mean? It's like, it goes back in time to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And, you know, when I was really young, I caught bits and pieces from my father. And, you know, that there was one line of our family was very poor and one was was royalty. And, you know, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And, you know, I just kind of collected all the bits and pieces of knowledge I had. I'm like, wow, am I living, am I am experiencing and I have to resolve internal trauma that, that, was carried to me from long ago, you know, from apparently hundreds, at least of years ago, perhaps someone in this royal lineage was beheaded and experienced something. And I'm dealing with, because there's this whole theory out there. We talk about trauma and I'm sure you've, you've interviewed some of the experts in this area, but we can inherit trauma. We can inherit trauma in our genes that traces back you know, not just previous generations, but generations back, you know, and I just kind of pulled everything together because I did not like having this dream. (laughs) And when I sat there and I really did that, I, it sounds almost strange to people and that's okay. Because what I did was like, all right, well, if this is, if this is an experience that, you know, some of my ancestors or one of my ancestors went through, I'm, I'm releasing it now. And I went through this exercise you know, gave it full focus. And I never had the dream again. I didn't get my head chopped off in the dream. That was it. That was the end of the dreams, you know? And again, it's, it's clearly quite fuzzy, but they're, the dreams are, are, you know, they're, they're revealed. We have so little knowledge scientifically about what all they actually do. We have some, you know, but, uh, but they are fascinating, you know, taking us back into a past that might've been, you know, in our, bloodline taking us toward future events like yours you know it, it is fascinating though <laughs> yeah so I had, a, I had a good friend for a bit i was learning from and working with named david dibble and he actually helped develop something called dream work i don't think he really teaches it to this day but um you might be able to find something out there on it but i'll tell you what his process for interpreting dreams was so amazing that every time I followed it, like, so if I got a dream, it was like, that was really weird, right? Like this thing happened, then this, and then like, yeah, they chopped a head off and then this gun came and then this, and you're like, I don't even watch those movies anymore. Like, where's this stuff coming from? Right. Cause 
you know, a, a kind of conventional thought is, oh, it's just a lot of your thoughts from your day to day or movies you watch or different experiences that are just getting jumbled up in your dreams at night. And I don't, it, it, the, so many experiences I've had with dreams and other people I've talked to have had with dreams and you sit in dream work workshops for entire retreats, like three, four, five day, and you go through this together and you realize, no, dreams are so much more than that. And they have so much wisdom to show us. We just have to learn how to interpret them because a, when we're in the dream state, we're in the subconscious and the subconscious only knows imagery and emotion. It doesn't have logic. It's not connected to the left brain. Right. So imagine yeah. like trying to tell somebody, let's say, hey, if you don't stop eating that pizza, you're going to get cancer and die. Right. Let's say you're trying to tell somebody that in a few words, I can tell somebody that pretty easy. But how do I tell somebody that by only giving them pictures and emotions? Right. Well, you'd be like, oh, well, it would be easy. Just show them eating pizza and then dying. Like that's not exactly how that works. Because that doesn't right. always make sense and the subconscious doesn't necessarily process things in that way. And we, you know, I don't know exactly why that doesn't necessarily work that way or why we wouldn't understand it that way. But I do know that the subconscious is speaking to us in, in pictures and visuals and emotions. And when we interpret it as, okay, what does this mean? Why is this showing up for me? What do I need to get from this? And the other thing is that the in dream work, they tell you that all people in your dream are you. It's a version of your mind, four different parts of your mind, masculine, feminine, spiritual, and authoritarian. It depends on their age and all of that. Like, okay, if it's, if it's like your father in your dream, well, was your father kind of the authority figure in your life? Okay, that's the authoritarian part of your mind. So what is this telling you about rules and you know, uh, foundations and things that you need to, to follow in your life. So anyway, it's a, you know, it's a weekend workshop, but to break it down, what I've discovered is when you learn that your dreams have really profound messages for you and you start to learn how to interpret them, dude, problems can get solved literally in, in a single dream. Like, oh my God, I don't know how to solve this problem in my business or what's going on with my health or this. I ask my dream, I wake up the next day, I do the interpretation, and the answer is so clear, it's amazing. And I've done it dozens and dozens and dozens of times, and it's, it's truly incredible, you know, what our, and I really think it's our soul speaking to us through our subconscious, guiding us to, to understand a deeper part of ourself. But hypnotherapy is similar, you know, I had a hypnotherapy session, like you go into your subconscious, right? And I looked down and it was, this was supposed to be, I didn't know it, but I think it was supposed to be like a past life regression kind of thing. And I looked down mm -hmm. and I had fur all over my feet and my <laughs> legs. And I just broke out laughing. I just started laughing, 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 laughing. I'm like, what is this? I'm looking down. I'm like, I'm covered in hair. And all of a sudden I look at myself and I was a Yeti. I was looking at, you know, I was a... <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> I was a Yeti. I can see you as a Yeti. <laughs> so if Yetis exist and past lives exist, apparently I was a Yeti in a past life. But in, in the hypnotherapy session or the past life regression or whatever it was, uh, at the end of it, I saw myself in a mirror and then went to, I saw my kind of broken self in a mirror. That yeah. self that we judge, that self that, is you know we're ashamed of that self that we're afraid to acknowledge that part of ourself and i saw it in a mirror and then i hugged hugged that part of myself and said i love you and this was guided to me through the process and that feeling at the end of that was just like i was totally free i came out of it and it was like all this deep you know judgment and fear and you know, insecurities that I had as a kid, like so much of that was released in that therapy session because of that, which was funny. It started as this funny Yeti thing and ended as this deeply emotional healing thing, you know, but yeah. it was, yeah. it was me being open to like, yeah, I'll try this hypnotherapy thing. It sounds crazy, but whatever, let's try it. Let's see if it helps, you know, and it helped. <laughs> it really did. Yeah. Hey, listen, if you, or possibly a Yeti. Uh, <laughs> I highly recommend you go deeper into that work and then please write a memoir 
my life as a Yeti. And I <laughs> promise you, you've got a bestseller and I will definitely. Read that. <laughs> Dude, I'm making, I'm making a note right now. My life. <laughs> so what was crazy? I got to tell you this other part, my life as a Yeti. Uh, I was like running through the mountainsides, like running through the hills. And yep. there was like people trying to chase me or something. Right. And I needed to get away from them. And how I got away from them was I opened a portal and I jumped through the port. So mind you, the, the therapist who's there with me, he's not telling me anything. He's just asking me what's yeah. happening next. What's happening next. And I'm not thinking of any of this. I'm not thinking of myself as a Yeti. I'm not, he's like, okay, now what, now what's happening? I'm like, I'm running through the hills. Okay. Now what do you see? Oh, I just opened a portal in front of me. And I jumped through the portal and closed it. And that's how I transported to like another part of the world. So if you want to understand how, how Yetis and Bigfoot can never be found, it's because they know I how to open to portals to other parts of the earth. You can't, you can't get them. You know, they got the portal thing figured out. But, uh, <laughs> I love it. but uh, that's a good book, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about writing it. I've never told, I don't think I've, I think I've only told my wife that story. So you and uh, however many thousands of people that are going to watch this now know that I was a Yeti in a past life. Yes. And I can see it. You wear Yeti well. I like it. <laughs> I am kind of tall, you know. Yes. Um, yeah. So what, so personal development. So Joe Mercola, you were helping his business. You, you helped a lot of people, Mark Hyman, others. I mean, you've been just like a, a entrepreneur marketing you know expert for such a long time but obviously a deeply caring big-hearted person who really cared deeply about personal development self-growth you know contributing to others um and wrote that book um and eventually got oh, eventually opened a company called the art of anti-aging so you're you you let's say you evolved into a passion for helping people with their health with you know seeing aging through a different lens through discovering ways to to live longer and healthier and better lives obviously that all you know ties into personal development but why like why anti-aging specifically yeah well <clears throat> So you're going to take me back to, to, to my story, which um, the truth is I'm not in my 80s. I'm 53 today. And you can <laughs> kind of cut well, my life, Nathan, right down, down the middle. And the first half of that, um, except for the very young years, but the first half of my life was, you know, quite challenging as well. You know, and I noticed, I noticed a pattern with all the, uh, not all, but many you know, of the most uh, impassioned, caring, um, frankly, you know, therefore perhaps educated people in, in this wonderful space where we're all trying to help people. A lot of them did have, a, you know, some serious childhood trauma, myself included. Um, you know, so up until my age of nine years old, my father was uh, was a good man. And then he, he turned severely alcoholic and severely abusive um, to me my sister to my mother and you know that persisted for years um now you know side note here i can talk very comfortably about all this today and and i find it important to do so to to let people know who have, might have gone through similar things or worse you know that uh, you know it is okay you know to open yourself about all this um you know and what i what i learned about him in bits and pieces uh, is that he lived um quite the life i mean it, it, you know, talk about books if it was a novel people wouldn't believe you know and it, there was some good in his life as i understand it but uh, you know there was also a lot of very traumatic events um you know just a uh, sampling so um as a child he was uh born in brooklyn but then moved back to hungary where he lived with an aunt who was apparently severely abusive so he experienced that himself in his youth right physical um, mostly physical uh, verbal, all uh, of it. In that, in that situation, I believe it was physical and emotional. And yep. then, um, you know, fast forward. So he's back in the United States and this is during World War II. He becomes a soldier and eventually a spy for the U.S. Um, you know, and he's stationed in Germany, posing, I believe, as a, as a German soldier, but he's working, you know, his U.S. military. So very dangerous work. And he falls in love with a woman 
who, as it turns out, and I don't think he knew this right away, was a Russian posing as, as a German. So they fell in love. Apparently they learned, you know, that each other were spies when they got very close with one That's another. Crazy. And they were going to, after the, you know, it's it sounds like a romantic novel already, right? but after the war was, you know, done, they were going to get married. Um, and then one day she disappeared. She was disappeared and he never could find a thing out about her again so he had that trauma wow. fast forward many years later again I'm, I'm skipping a lot of pieces here because there's ups and downs but you know in his marriage before being married to my mother which he was for the last 25 years of his life but before that um in that in his previous marriage he had two sons and then uh you know he they got divorced and uh, his 13 year old, his young boy from that marriage, when he was 13, I was only three years old at the time, was hit and killed um, by a car while riding his bike. Wow. So he had a lot. I just give you the big. Oh, one more. I mean, he was actually married a time before that. And uh, he got in an argument with this woman and who was his wife at the time and apparently she opened the door to step out because she was raging mad and he watched as a truck plowed into her and killed her so he, he he dealt he experienced these things in his life but this was in a time where hearkening back to some of our earlier conversation you really didn't go to a psycho psychologist a therapist back then you know, because you had to be crazy. It was not perceived as a thing you'd do. So he didn't deal with any of that in the, in the correct way. We are given a gift today that we're all so much more accessible to all of us, our different therapies and therapy modalities and individuals practicing it. And on a much wider scale today, it's socially acceptable. Right. Not entirely. We still have a ways to go. But back then, nope, unless you were truly crazy, you don't do that. So he held all this in. He eventually took it out on the bottle. He took it out on us. You know, it was abusive to us and so on and so forth. Of course, I didn't understand all that as a young boy, um, but I did come to understand a lot of that later on when I when I did the work, which took me years to deal with. Um, but uh, long story short, the, the work meaning you, the work meaning you had to find a way to understand why he abused you. And then find the power to forgive him, right? Absolutely. You got it. You nailed it, Nathan. And uh, yeah, I mean, I did a lot of work and I did a lot of different, you know, uh, modalities of official and unofficial therapy. By unofficial, I mean talking to a lot of the right people as well, just, you know, as friends and so forth. And I'll get to that point in a minute because I'm going to narrow down the answer to your question here because it can be quite expansive. So, he quit the bottle. Even then, though, he he um, experienced some horrible diseases and spent the last 10 years of his life basically dying, mm -hmm. uh, not just physically, but also in terms of his mindset. So he was still very bitter. Um, and he was in and out of hospitals for those last 10 years. The last six months, he was in hospitals entirely, never got home again. And, and we, my mother, my sister and I were there at these hospitals often. So that's another side of the story where we witnessed, I witnessed uh, how inept, frankly, the medical system is. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of stories there, but I realized even at that age, and I'm talking now 19, 20, 21 years old, oh my God, this, this is not a system. The system seems to be good for emergency care, but this system doesn't know what the hell it's doing when it comes to disease. Um, and one of many important points, they seem to have no compassion either while they're at it. Seems to me pretty important, you know, that we, we better take care of our own health. I started to get the nuggets of that idea at that very young age, having to be basically a soldier in the hospital, um, watching my mom, having to watch these doctors and correct many, many mistakes that they were making along the way. Like what kind That's of, part. like what, like what are some mistakes you could share? Oh my goodness, medical mistakes galore, getting the wrong medications, um, you know, putting them inside of his body and oops, you know, wrong this, wrong that. I mean, you know, things just, just almost on a routine basis. And, you know, it's okay, they're human, okay, but they're, they're, they're also doctors. The problem is that we put our life in their hands. And, uh, you know, and, and man, I, doctors are some of my best friends, some of the doctors, right? You know, the ones, I, they're heroes of mine, those that have embraced integrative health, because I know what system they come out of. You know, I'm t doing a lot of sidetracks here, and here's one more, but they come out of a system where they're taught in medical school, even to this day, this is the way, this is what matters. 
and here's your 10 hours maximum of nutrition training, which is ridiculous. This is what matters. Well, they're, they're kind of, in, it's imposed on them. For those who break out of that mode, there's some that are well known and good friends, Dr. Furman, Dr. You know, Perlmutter, many people know their names, they're friends. And kudos to these people for being able to break out of that mode. But many of the doctors get caught in this mode where they feel almost like they're God. And, 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 they're, and, and the tools, the magic that they're using are called, you know, pharmaceuticals. And we're going to work the magic with these pharmaceuticals. And they actually believe themselves that healthcare equals pharmaceuticals right. and surgery, which is the most, you know, horrible mindset, you know, out there of all that we live in, that we all need to break away from. And so many of us are trying to change that perception yeah. of healthcare. So I diverted on the path. Well, well, one, one point there, and then I want you to keep telling the story, please, is, you know, medical errors is the third leading cause of death. Yep. Almost a half a million people between a quarter million to a half million. And this is just estimated. My guess is the numbers are larger than this. But between a quarter million to a half million people die every year from medical errors, I meaning the wrong prescriptions, the wrong, the wrong surgery that's on the chart for the wrong person, the wrong chart in the wrong room, the the wrong drugs for the that particular issue, the combination of different drugs. So many errors happen. And and you know, we're not here to, you know, blame any specific medical doctor and, and when they're treating an acute you know, situation like we know, like they can be life saving, but just as you said, for chronic health conditions, cancer, diabetes, autoimmune disease, heart disease, any of these issues, the conventional medical system is not designed or trained or taught how to help you heal or prevent these diseases. And drugs, most of the time, are not the answer. But think about it. Think if you were in an industry, think if you sold a supplement that killed a half a million people a year. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. 250 to 500,000 people a year and you were able just to keep making billions of dollars selling that. Like how crazy is that to That's think crazy. about? You know, really you have a supplement that kills one person, you're done forever. You know what I mean? Like and they you know, they can accidentally kill hundreds of thousands of people every year and there's no consequence. I mean, there might be some consequence for them, but most of them have no liability. The hospitals don't have liability. You sign it away when you go to the hospital. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, anyway, <laughs> and, sorry, I mean, for, sorry for the tangent, about, but it's yeah. it's my. Well, this is an important tangent. I mean, Nathan, you know, with uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not. Some some drugs, some pharmaceuticals are necessary, and they're helpful. Um, they can be. Uh, you know, my own number, it's not official, but I'd say, you know, 25% of what you know is used today ought to be used. The other 75% is is over reliance. It's patchwork, it's band-aid, it's it's not really focusing on the core cause and the issue. It's not curative, that's for sure. Nor is the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, motivated in any way, shape, or form to be curative. Why would they do that? Why, if you're running a business, would you try to come up with cures? Because then you you if you cure something. You don't have any profit versus medications that that's patch it over instead. Oh, I don't know. You have a heart, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but well, I've been. Here's the other part. Of, man, so many stories for you, Nathan. Because I one of the first real jobs I had after you know getting out of school and struggling as a young father was in marketing inside the pharmaceutical industry. And there's good people in there. There's good yeah. individuals, but as a system, it's as bad as people think. I'm just going to say that straight, straight up. It really is. And they don't have a heart as a system. There's people with hearts and a lot of care who are individuals, but the system as a whole does not have a heart. And their whole system is modeled on not curing. You got to have disease. And, and if you create billion, you know, multi-billion dollar drugs that, that help situate or, or, or manage a disease that's one thing if you cure that disease you just cut out your entire profit and and, and they're beholden to shareholders end of story let me jump back <laughs> to the story here because i could go deep on all this stuff um so long story short he finally died a horrible death to be honest uh, you know and that was traumatic as well um and then i was very i became a, a 
around the same time, a very young father myself. I was dirt poor, so poor, in fact, that, you know, we were living in this very small studio apartment in a rough part of Chicago and couldn't even afford a bed. And, you know, I had my little baby and my wife at the time and I are sleeping on two twin mattresses on the floor. I was visited by mice routinely at night and tickling me with their whiskers. Um, I could just tell so many stories, <laughs> but the point is it was rough. Yeah. Nonetheless, sounds, sounds rough. What? kept me going during this time. There were a few things, but the number one thing that Nathan that kept me going was powerful women in my life. Powerful women, a wonderful mother. At that time, uh, you know, um, my sister was fantastic. Wonderful sister and mother for sure, but also certain teachers, certain friends, and they all happened to be female and they really stood by there for me and really honestly, uh, likely saved my life all right i was going through anxiety and you know episodes of depression and so on and so forth like that just to push through and and to my wife at the time's credit and, and my own credit i guess even dirt poor like that you know we started with community college and we we pushed our way working full-time going to college full-time while raising a baby and, and found our way through all this but it's it's powerful women that were so and are still so central to my life so I told you, all right, first real job, I, one of the first real jobs out of college was this uh, middle management communications job in this pharmaceutical company. I had to stay for a while because I'm putting you know, food on the table. It's the first real money I'd ever seen, I guess you could say. Uh, but I, did, I couldn't stomach staying too long, finally found my way out of that. Real long story short, that was around the time that businesses were discovering the internet. I happened to be involved in some of the very first projects, you know, regarding internet inside of these businesses became became a hot commodity. And that's when I moved over, simultaneously started digging deeper into natural health on my own. And uh, then I did get, you know, basically it's like the equivalent of a, you know, the hooked up with this doctor who nobody knew who I could tell was kind of crazy in multiple conversations with him, but I also could tell he was brilliant. And he also somehow or other, you know, had heard about me and said, Hey, can you help me? I want to you know, put this message out to the world. The whole system screwed. And I want to try to correct that. That's Joe Mercola. And I said, sure. And so we, you know, we really, uh, you know, he had already had basically the equivalent back then of some articles and a small file, but we really exploded that thing together and the rest is kind of history as you go along here. So, you know, I told you other bits and pieces, but why the art of anti-aging? Well, back in 2018, um, you know, I had retired the personal growth business. I achieved what I wanted to achieve with that. Um, and uh, I was helping others again behind the scenes, Nathan. And at that time, I was like, you know, I could do a lot of things here. But I started to notice, talk about mindset. This is the very first thing I mentioned in this conversation. I started to notice that these powerful women, strong women who had helped me as they're hitting their 40s, like my wife at the time, 50s, my sister, uh, 60s, uh, my mother in 70s, um, and so on and others. These powerful women were getting impacted by this pervasive message out there that getting older equals being over the hill. You're downhill from here. And I saw that even impacting these heroes of mine, frankly, I'm like, that is nonsense. Now it's been decades that I've been researching natural health and wellness and working with all of these fascinating and brilliant doctors and MDs, you know, who are daring to be different and step outside, you know, like I mentioned, the Furmans and the Perlmutters and the Hymans of the world and, and a lot, you know, of others like them who may not be as well known as there. And I'm like, that's not true at all. These ought to be the years that you shine, that you thrive, and not just in an interior emotional maturity sense, but even physically. That's nonsense. That's not true. So long story short, in honor of these women, I'm like, I'm going to bring this message to the world, and I'm just going to share all of these very physical, mental, and emotional truths fact-based information, easy to understand with people to give them the guidance, you know, even if their health is horrible now and they're 40, 50, 60, 70, even older, to improve on that. That's the real start of the art of anti-aging. And the anti, again, is mostly about anti this bullshit about getting older equals doom. Yeah. Beautiful. What's, one, what's something that you've learned in the last few years of doing 
hundreds of interviews at this point, right, with with many of the top experts out there in longevity and anti aging. What's something you learned that like shocked you that that you know if you do this thing in your life, this thing will not only increase you know your your happiness and your health, but increase your longevity. This thing will help with anti aging in a way. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, what's some? I know there's a hundred things, but what's something yeah. that like really was surprising to you? Yeah, wow, that's a big question. It's okay. So I, I'll tell you this. You know, it's like I can almost oversimplify, but sometimes it's helpful. You know what I've learned that that health is, and you know, it's it's about what we stri- striving to keep the wrong things out yep. of our being while trying to bring more of the good in. Sounds very simple and it's true. Now we've talked a lot about, you know, the things that we allow in or bring in mentally, emotionally, sense through sensory experiences. We bring in experiences like we talked about from the nine intense experiences, playing more. Um, Nature is is certainly important in getting out there. We've all heard that recently. Thank goodness. Um, You know, engaging in works of brilliance. You know, there's a lot of health benefit to that doing the work of therapy. These are mind emotional things, right, Nathan? Um, and doing the work, of course, is profoundly important of, of, of working on trauma. I'm, I'm a living testament. You're a living testament to the importance of that. Um, those are important things. But when I really started to go, you know, dig really deep, and we're talking a long time ago now, um, but what I increasingly shocks me is how poisoned or we are physically as well by the world we live in and what increasingly shocks me specifically is we've got 20 years ago 15 years ago you know a lot of these docs i was i'm working with or used to work with uh, and still friends with and still help out you know they were being called quacks because they dared suggest that eating food that doesn't have, you know, wasn't sprayed with pesticides and herbicides, food that is not highly processed. Back then, you know, you've got all the people who call everyone quacks today still. Anybody who dares put ideas out there that that oppose the mainstream, you're going to call them some, there's going to be a group of people, they're quacks, they're crazy, that's nonsense. They were calling people quacks who suggested that eating non-processed food, clean food is important. Now I'm looking 20 years to, you know, I'm like, well, that's pretty standard today. Right. Everybody doesn't know that, but many people know it and nobody's going to call someone a quack for saying eat less processed food. So now I'm looking today and I'm like, what shocks me today is, is a lot of scientists actually who I've learned from regarding toxins we're allowing into our body through the skin and through the air we breathe. There are three basic physical ways into your body physically we're talking it's what you put in your mouth what you breathe in ultimately through your lungs you know whether it's through your mouth or nose and through your skin that's it there's micro cases you have eyes and and you know there's things can get in through your eyes like sunshine for example but those are the three ways into your body yeah. and we've given a lot of emphasis which is great into being careful about what we put in our mouth What shocks me is that even today's most health conscious eaters by what they put in their mouth are not paying nearly enough attention yet to what they're putting into their bodies through their skin and frankly, through the air they breathe. So that to me is shocking because of, I can go deep on this if you want to, Nathan. I don't know if we have the time, but you know, I can go deep on this, but we are putting a ton of horrible things into our body that are causing all kinds of so-called mystery symptoms and diseases like cancer, like, you know, neurotoxins in our brain causing issues. I can go on, but that's the shortest answer. Yeah. Well, I re- I remember, uh, I mean, when I learned, you know, something I, I tell people all the time is what you put on your body becomes your body, your cells eat what you put on your body. Literally, what you're putting on your body becomes your body. And I I learned this probably 15 plus years ago, right? And so I cleaned up all my soaps and detergents and shampoos and everything I was putting on my body. I started buying organic and simple and clean, you know, toothpaste, everything, everything that goes on my body, right? All of that. So I knew this 
years ago and have been been that way for a long time. So for me, it's just a very you know normal, natural thing. And I, I've been really shocked too, still to this day, some of the top, I won't name any names, some of the top health experts out there who are brilliant in their field. Uh, and, and I talk to them about some of these things about, you know, the skin, about the air in their homes. And they, they don't know anything about it because they've so myopically focused in on the food, which they've become brilliant about. Yep. But they don't realize, you know, they're still using the same chemicals and toxins and pollutants and all that in their toothpaste and their shampoos and their lotions and not, and not real and haven't cleaned up the air in their home, not realizing that they're putting so many toxins into their body through their skin and their breath, as you're talking about every single day and so you know the yeah i do want you to talk a little bit about it because one thing you told me i think a few years ago when we talked you said something that's always that's always stuck with me is you know the the um the uh skincare industry the beauty industry is like the wild west and when you said that it was like okay now i get why they can put all of these different kinds of chemicals into these products without real regulation. You know, you said, look, they just don't really regulate this industry very well. Cause you look at these bottles. It's like, how can they allow, how can our government and our regulatory bodies allow 20 different chemicals into a bottle that we know is going into our organs, into our bloodstream. We know our carcinogenic, potentially carcinogenic, you know, have been banned from other countries, you know, our endocrine disruptors. And not only does this one have 20, but this one has 20 and this one has 18 and this one has 15. And then you're putting, you know, 80 different, you know, chemicals onto your body, your mouth, your body, uh, every single day. Like yeah. how does our agencies allow this and you said well it's it's like the wild west there's just not much regulation and i'm just like oh my god yeah yeah it's awful yeah you know it's here here here's it straight uh we have been as a society as a um, almost a, at least the western world uh, brainwashed into not perceiving our skin as really just another organ of our body we don't think of skin that way. We collectively, I do, but, you know, I've been immersed in this, but people don't think of their skin and they experiment on it, but it is an organ. It's the largest organ. It's the front line and arguably the most important organ involved in your immunity. It works hard to keep most of the stuff that you don't want inside of your body out all day, every day. Now, People will nonetheless will experiment all day long um, with lotions and potions and perfumes, not thinking twice about the fact that what you put on your body is largely consumed into your body. In fact, most of, most of these lotions, potions, et cetera, they're not going to do anything unless they do penetrate into your body. So, so they have one class of ingredients is called penetrators, which are horrible because they pull everything else into your body. All right. So they pull all the other chemicals that are in these products into your uh, into your body. Um, so we've been trained not to think about it. But I, I say to people, look, you know, would you just blindly accept that this long list of chemicals, would you take those chemicals, please, and just apply them on top of your liver, on top of your kidneys, on your brain, on your heart? Would you do that? Well, no, no, I wouldn't do that. I thought well, you were going to say on top of something scared. else where your hand right. is going. I was like, well, yeah. no, I wouldn't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> That's an organ. No, exactly. None of these organs, man, except none of them. Skin, we can do that. Why? Because it's safe. Who told you it's safe? It's not safe. You are consuming one of my favorite statistics, the average woman. And I've said this before, and it's, it bears repeating, uses 12 personal care products a day. On average, they contain 168 different chemicals. Yes. Another favorite statistic, in the European Union and other countries, over 1,600 chemicals have been banned or extremely limited from use in cosmetics and personal care. Here in the United States, 11, just 11 ingredients banned. It is an incredibly powerful industry. And by the way, the beauty industry, the cosmetic industry, the personal care products industry sounds massive, but then they never add in the equation, the chemical industry, 
which is really benefiting from all this and making it incredibly massive and incredibly powerful there in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. It's not going to change. The most substantial legislation uh, regarding this whole cosmetics personal care industry was passed in 1938 by Jeez. the FDA. There's been no real changes since then. And indeed, Nathan, that's when they said, you're on your own, self-regulate. Today, you can, anybody listening can put anything they want, you call it an anti-aging cream, call it a shampoo, stick it on a shelf and sell it. There's no oversight whatsoever. Now, of course, these companies, giant, massive companies to the boutique brands are not going to put anything in there that immediately harms you. It's too easy to trace to them, but they have no problem putting any of these way more, honestly, than 1600, but 1600 have been banned elsewhere. They have no problem sticking it in these products because they know on an immediate basis, your skin's not going to start bubbling. It takes a little while for all these chemicals to accrue inside your body, hit all your organs. Many of them have long half-lives. So they stay in your system, in some cases forever, wreaking all kinds of havoc. Why am I dizzy all the time? Why do I have these weird rashes? Why am I out of breath? Why do I have stomach you know, issues and I can't explain it? I'll tell you why, because you're feeding your body toxins. Toxins, especially and abundantly through these 12 average personal care products you're using daily. And they're, they're, they take time, but yes, it's death by a thousand cuts. Mm. The beauty of this, the beauty, as you yourself noted, compared to other changes that are important for us to make, Nathan, we know we have to change our diets, many of us. That's not easy. We know we need to get a lot more exercise. That's not easy. We know we got to get, you know, ideally, hopefully go through therapy and do the work to, to you know, reduce the impact of this trauma on our lives. But that's not easy. But guess what? The beauty of this one is it's easy. Friggin' change out all these cosmetics loaded with toxins, and so many of them are, and replace them with beautifully thing. You know, today is we have certifications, USDA certified organic versions of many things. And if you need a place to start because it's not affordable even to do that, please start with everyone listening, whatever you apply directly to your skin that is designed to sit there all day long, because it's sitting there all day long, leaching into your body. I'm talking deodorant, change it for an organic, clean one. I'm talking, you know, skin lotions and potions and, and, and you know, your anti-aging creams, change it for certified organic versions. Anything that sits on your skin, number one place to start, then work your way out to things like shampoos, you do rinse it out. Some of it's gone. There's still residue, but it's it, it's a few levels less. But nonetheless, that's that's the bottom line here. So th it's alarming to me. Like you said, it alarms me how many incredibly health conscious people are not because they haven't gotten the message on this yet. Yeah, I love your passion about it. I know you you even started a skincare company because you've been so passionate about it, which I love because it's 100% organic, certified organic. And that's what I tell people, it's like, start there, right? Get, get the main things organic. At the very least, look at the label, the back of the label and see that it's all stuff that you can read. You understand what it is. It's all plants. You know, it's all uh, simple words that you understand that are not additives and fillers and preservatives. And if it's 100% USDA certified organic, then you know it's not full of any of that crap. So you know, that's a good place to start. And um, yeah, I know, I know, dude, we could talk about, I love your, your passion and your, and your deep knowledge on this topic. Um, we could talk about this stuff for hours. Uh, I know our time is, is running up and I want people to be able to connect with you deeper, dive into your work, um, you know, learn more about you and, and just the awesome companies that you have. So with that, yeah, brother, number one, thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing these great stories and sharing your heart. And, um, you know, just I love you, man, and all that you do and uh, appreciate you a lot. And um, yeah. And then number two, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you and learn more about all the cool things that you're up to? Yeah, well, uh, I love you, too. And what you're doing, you, you're you're 
fighting the good fight and you're doing it in such a wonderful way, Nathan. I mean, uh, respect back to you. And I love the forum here that you've created, for example, um, you know, to be able to have the longer conversations, necessary conversations. This is fantastic. I've enjoyed this so much. Um, finding me. Uh, yeah, go to the art with a, the in front of it, theartofantiaging.com. Um, you know, sign up if you want to free newsletter there. We've always got a great, we put a lot of work in our free reports that we give away. I mean, they could be pages long and do all the research and I'm sure, you know, you'll find a good one there. We change them up sometimes. So check that out. Or you can go to Purity Woods if you are interested, puritywoods.com. You know, the real short story on that is uh, I started that USDA certified organic skincare company because I couldn't find any of the products that I needed for myself. So my wife and I both, she's a cosmetologist. We were both the first you know, even before I realized I wanted to make a company out of it, we, we you know, we were the first customers for, for the products over there, or at least, you know, the, the earliest ones, including the age defying dream cream, because I had some crow's feet around my eyes. I knew the right ingredients I was looking for, and I knew I didn't want a bunch of toxins to go along with it, and I couldn't find it, you know, so we created it. It worked. I'm like, ah, you know, I'm definitely going to create, put this out to the world, and it's done remarkably well. At so that's, so that's what makes you look you know, 40 when you're 87. That's, that's why right. you, that's why you look 40 <laughs> while you're 87 is the age defined dream cream. All right. I got it. It's all I, the age defined dream cream and nothing but no, it's <laughs> bad as well as, you know, some good old water that I keep sipping here and many other things too. But yeah, that's key. It helps. You know. It's, it's good ingredients. Actually, my wife uses it and um, it's, it's really, really good stuff. Yeah. If you want a good anti-aging cream, that is the one get rid of. You know, it's interesting because a lot of stuff out there, it it works immediately, right? It's got chemicals in it that like makes your skin like tighter immediately. Yep. But all those toxins, man, there you're not getting to the root cause. You're putting a band aid on, and then you're potentially causing hormone problems, potentially causing inflammation in the body, potentially causing liver damage, right? You're potentially causing chronic inflammation that leads to cancer. For what? For a quick little fix? Whereas it's fast food, it's fast food. You know? Yeah, it's, it's fast, fast food, food through your skin. That's it that's, is. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. And the but, irony is, is that it, it does, it, you know, maybe, for example, we're talking anti-aging creams, last thing I'll say here, you apply it. Yes, you might have, you know, this fast food effect. Oh, tomorrow, the next day, that it looks tighter and, you know, whatever. Ironically, though, even over the somewhat shorter term, certainly midterm, it causes early aging. So it's having, you know, it's going to cause more wrinkles, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's enough said about that because that, that is a passion area of mine, but uh, yeah, I, you know, appreciate you brother and all that you do. Awesome, dude. Yeah. This was great, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. And um, Hey, all you guys tuning in, appreciate you for being here. Uh, go check out purity woods, puritywoods.com. Go check out the art of anti-aging and um if any books are available actually i want to get a copy of it um i know you don't really yeah, it's out there on amazon i know you don't really promote it now but the nine intense experiences i was reading the i was reading the reviews on it and people love it dude people absolutely love it so what a good book um that is still available so um go check it out thanks brian appreciate you man take care take it easy thank you for listening to the nathan crane podcast Please make sure to subscribe and share this on social media. Then head over to NathanCrane.com for your free ebook. So when we're talking about, you know, what are these underlying causes and conditions of these chronic diseases, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, they all have very similar, if not identical causes. And that's the thing is when we get to the root cause of these diseases, we can not only prevent these diseases from ever happening, but empower our bodies to heal from them. In every one of our cells, we have tens and hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions that are happening every second that are cycling uh, back and forth. It's like sort of a, a yin and yang. And you know, for me, the soul, the soul's purpose is evolution. It doesn't care about comfort, it cares about evolution. Mm. And so I think so long as we are following our soul, then we will evolve. And I think what sometimes blocks us from living our purpose, from manifesting that next level of our expression, is we have not evolved.
there is also a time for letting go all the expectations and relax and just breathe and be grateful what, for what you have achieved.